public policy and citizenship studies here at FIU. Uh, a little bit about our programs. First of all, we have a number of certificate programs that we offer. Uh, you all are aware that when you go to college, you're working on a degree, you're working on a major in something or other, uh, maybe a minor in something or other. There are also certificates that are available at many universities, including FIU, uh, in a wide variety of subjects to try to help students get a focus on particular information. So we have a public policy studies certificate at the undergraduate level. We have North American studies, and we have national security studies, and we also have a graduate certificate in national security studies for people who already have bachelor's degrees, maybe working on master's degrees or PhDs or just the certificates. We also have an internship program at the U.S. Southern Command. Uh, if you're not aware of what Southcom is, the Defense Department has the world rather divided up into regions, and each region has a combined combatant command that is responsible for that region. So there's a European command, there's an African command, there's a Northern command that takes care of North America, there's a Pacific command. Um, you've all probably heard of the Central Command, which is based out of Tampa, and those are the people who are running the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and in those areas. Um, and we have located about four or five miles from here in Doral, we have the headquarters of the U.S. Southern Command. And Southcom is responsible for Latin America and the Caribbean, everything kind of south of, of Mexico and east of Mexico. Uh, so we've had about 60 students from FIU who have gone over there and have been able to participate in the internship program. It's a very valuable learning experience for people. Some people have also worked into jobs uh, after they finished their internship. We have a program in National Security Studies. Um, we are designated as one of several universities around the country as an intelligence community center for academic excellence. Uh, we're very proud of that. We were one of the first four universities in, in the country to be so designated. We have our certificate programs. We have a, an annual colloquium, a one-day conference we put on about some aspect of national security studies. We have a high school outreach program some of you may have participated in. We have in the fall and spring semesters a one-day simulation exercise here at FIU. And we have a high school um, summer institute that's a week-long activity. It's going to be this year, June 9th to 13th. And you can go to our website and, and find applications to apply for it. Uh, the Summer Institute will be a number of interactive learning exercises, simulation exercises. There's going to be one that's going to work with structured analytic techniques uh, as people in the intelligence community work with them. And they're going to be focusing on the Mumbai bombing, uh, and they're going to be doing an analysis and try to see what they can determine from that. There's going to be another one about assessing political stability in the Western Hemisphere. And then there's going to be another one on another day that's going to be uh, run by an analyst from the U.S. Southern Command. We also will have a career panel. Every year we have a, a number of people who come in representing different federal agencies and talk about careers and internships and opportunities for students. So again, uh, it's going to be June 9th to the 13th. It's a week-long exercise, and uh, we, we hope that some of you will be interested and want to apply for that. Uh, the idea of the Intelligence Community Centers for Academic Excellence is to try to broaden the talent pool for the intelligence community. That's 16 different agencies of, of the federal government that have something to do with collecting and analyzing intelligence. Uh, they are looking to seek diversity. They're looking for a wide variety of people. They decided after September 11th, after the terrorist attack in 2001, that they were getting people out of the best universities, 
Princeton and Yale and Harvard and really good universities and we're getting really good people and they were all being trained the same way. So they were all thinking alike and they weren't thinking out of the box and, and doing the kinds of analysis that might be more beneficial. So they want to, uh, to, to reach out to different communities. The intelligence community agencies include the Central Intelligence Agency, I'm sure you've all heard of the CIA, um, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is law enforcement, federal law enforcement, mostly operating domestically, but they also have a large uh, unit of, of analysts that don't carry, they carry badges but not guns, okay? Um, and they, they work anti-terrorism, anti-intelligence, um, uh, trying to stop other countries from spying on our country, do a variety of things, the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, Homeland Security Department, uh, that includes the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is usually enlisted as a separate entity because of its unique characteristics. The State Department has an Intelligence Bureau. Uh, the Treasury Department does too, and the Energy Department. You don't necessarily think of those agencies as being intelligence, but think about energy, think about nuclear power, nuclear weapons, uh, think about our our dependence on oil and petroleum products, uh, so they are very definitely part of the community. Uh, the rest of the agencies within the IC are in the Defense Department. That includes the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, two days ago, I was in Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon. Uh, we had some graduate students from FIU who were making presentations to some high-level officials within the Defense Intelligence Agency. So we have a lot of activity with them. Um, each branch of the uniformed military has its own intelligence, Navy, Air Force, Army, Marines. The National Reconnaissance Office is a, a agency that has satellites up in space. They're the hardware people. Uh, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency takes the information coming out of the satellites and other sources and tries to analyze it and see what it means. And then the National Security Agency is in charge of signals intelligence. Or they're the people who get in trouble from time to time because they collect too much information on American citizens. Um, there have been a lot of issues with that lately. I'm sure you've, you've heard some of that information as well. And then there's sort of a 17th federal agency after September uh, 11th terrorist attacks, they decided to set up another agency to try to coordinate the 16 agencies better. Uh, and so now we have the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and James Clapper is currently the director there. Another program that we have is our 20th Century and Contemporary Issues program. I uh, will give you a little taste of that uh, today, and this is intended to help students who are in the International Baccalaureate program to prepare for the big exams that come up. It's a fully online program, uh, it's five three-hour interactive modules, and it is uh, instructed by Dr. Juan Cespedes, who you're about to meet if you haven't already met him, uh, and, and I'm going to show you a little bit of information. Oops. Don, he joined with two other party leaders, Grigore E. Zinoviev and Lev B. Kadinev, who held strong positions in the party organization, and together they proved powerful enough to shear Trotsky of a considerable degree of his
Um, any any questions or discussion about any of the things that I've, I've uh, shared with you? I'm about to pass out a flyer. On one side, it's got information about the Summer Institute that I just mentioned. Uh, and on the other side, it's got information about the 20th Century Program for you. And if there are no questions for me, I would like for you to welcome Dr. Juan Cespedes. He's an educator, he's an author, he's an examiner for the International Baccalaureate Organization, an organization you may have heard of before, um, and he's a test bank writer for the Florida Department of Education, so he's a, a well-known expert on the subjects that he's about to speak to you about. That was loud, wasn't it? Good morning, everybody. You guys are terrific for being here. Uh, it goes to show you why uh, people in this kind of program are the movers and the shakers of the future. I truly believe that. Here we were in a horrible day. It was raining cats and dogs and cows and pigs and whatever else when I woke up. Frankly, I, I thought to myself, okay, this morning is going to be uh, Dr. Swig and I. We're going to have a cup of coffee and we're going to go home because there's not going to be anyone. And I stopped counting at 33 people. So uh, congratulations on a long weekend, on the rainiest of days. The, the applause is for you. You should applaud yourselves. You, you guys are the movers and the shakers. Give yourselves a hand. I must say, it was easy getting up in the morning, however, because at about 4.30ish, there was crashing thunder and lightning, which lit up my entire room. And uh, I was, you know, not, uh, not able to sleep very much after that. I also thank Dr. Duhigg for calling me an expert. That means I'm in trouble, because whenever you're an expert, you have to know all the answers, or so I'm told, and I'm certainly, uh, in that regard, I'm not an expert. But I know a thing or two about the 20th century and uh, contemporary history and uh, contemporary issues. And let's start our review today by talking about the Cold War. Uh, definitely, uh, I believe, in this norm, uh, the Cold War often turned hot. and. Um, and we're going to take a look at this today. Oops, I did something wrong already. There we go. A Cold War, a period of uh, a period of intense rivalry between the superpowers, and these are the subsections. If you were to analyze what the Cold War was all about, these are the subsections. You've got military coalitions, most notably in Europe. You have the Warsaw Pact and NATO. Okay. Ideology, communism, uh, 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 a uh, totalitarian ideology, uh, perhaps, not, perhaps not as envisioned by Marx, but that's the way it turned out. A single party state uh, versus, a, versus pluralistic democracies, uh, market economies versus a command economy. So that's what we mean by um, ideology. Uh, a, a psychological and, a, and an espionage factor uh, whereby both superpowers have allies and they try to undermine each other. Uh, technological developments, they try to, uh, they, well, they try to outproduce and uh, have a more quality of life for, for their people and uh, higher military preparedness than the other. Uh, for that, definitely count the space race in there. Space race, beautiful as it was and exciting as it was, to put people first in, uh, in orbit and eventually on the moon. Uh, it had a, a military angle, a very real military angle. Costly defense spending, all of this cost billions and billions of dollars. Uh, ultimately, it, as, as we will see later on, it was a drain on the Soviet economy. They could never keep up, even though they, uh, they spent uh, a substantially larger percentage of, of their GDP back in called GNP. 
on, uh, on the military. And, um, and for the military, you have the conventional side, tanks, artillery pieces, et cetera, et cetera, and also the, uh, the more technological, the ICBMs, the inter intercontinental ballistic missiles, and so forth. And last but not least, a war usually between proxies or by proxies. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions for the proxy wars. Um, in, uh, in Korea, we fight the, we, the United States fights, the communist Chinese directly. And um, in Vietnam, of course, we fight the uh, North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong, the VC. Okay. We will attempt to touch on the Cold War from 45 to 91, uh, highlights of the Cold War. If we were to do the, the entire Cold War, it would probably be a three-day lecture. And uh, I think you've got other plans for the weekend. Okay? And here are some of the highlights. Let's start off with the Chinese Civil War. Mao Zedong versus Chiang Kai-shek. Mao and Chiang have been at each other since the 1920s. Uh, there is, after the war ends, uh, as World War II ends with the Japanese withdrawing from China, there's a temporary truce uh, between uh, Chiang and Mao. It is mediated by, uh, by the United States. It, does, uh, it is to no avail. We will get each other's throats. And by 1946, January, uh, the battles between the nationalists or the booming gun and the, and the communists resume. Okay. Uh, General George C. Marshall is uh, the key individual here, but uh, it doesn't work for, for General Marshall. Uh, later on, uh, during the McCarthy hearings, uh, he will be blamed for the quote-unquote loss of China. Of course, China was not General Marshall's to lose to begin with, but that's the way it came out. Okay? <coughs> Uh, the United States will, will aid the nationalists, and of course the, uh, the communists will be aiding the uh, the, uh, the Mao Zedong's uh, people. Okay. Um, the war goes badly for Chiang Kai-shek by 1948. The, the nationalist Chinese armies are on the ropes, and eventually uh, they, uh, the communists offer the. The, the mostly agrarian Chinese population, something that is reminiscent, although not exactly, but, but very reminiscent of uh, Lenin's peace, land, and bread. Uh, an end of war, a unified China, land for the peasants, and, um, and therefore, you know, a better standard of living, and you'll be able to feed yourselves. Um, of course, they're going to take back that land once they get it, once they subdivide. Um, land and, and give to the peasants, uh, eventually the nationalists, sorry, the communists will collectivize their things. But that's not, uh, that's not their selling point right at that moment. Okay. Uh, the communists were well established in the north and the northeast. Uh, that is the communists, I'm sorry, if I said nationalists, and the nationalists had an advantage in numbers and men and weapons, but slowly but surely that will be eroded. They were less disciplined than the communist troops, and uh, the communists certainly have a, a propaganda on their side. They're also exhausted by the war that they had with the Japanese. Okay. January 1949, Mao and his troops march into Beijing, and there you have a, you have a photograph of the, uh, of the entry. As, a, as an analyst of history, I, uh, I look at the photographs and, uh, and frankly see in this photograph um, a certain ambivalence in the crowds. They don't know what to expect. You don't see, you don't see these people cheering. But anyway, it's for you to analyze. Chiang Kai-shek will flee to Taiwan, also known as Formosa. Uh, the nationalists, or the Kuomintang ruling party, will control Formosa and the uh, nearby islands. There will be, from that point on, a very real geopolitical struggle between uh, those people that favor <coughs> recognizing Chiang Kai-shek as the legitimate government of China, 
and those people that recognize Mao Zedong. If you are, essentially, if you are, are, are on our side, so to speak, then you're recognizing Taiwan and, uh, and the uh, government in Taipei. If you uh, recognize Mao in Beijing, you are on the other side, and you are um, on the other side of that uh, struggle that's called the Cold War. Okay, let's look at the Greek Civil War. Certainly in Europe, the first major struggle in this Cold War. Uh, essentially, you have a conflict between the Greek governmental army, backed by the United, United Kingdom and the United States, and the Democratic Army of Greece, the military branch of the Greek Communist Party. And that is backed by Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Albania. Certainly these are nothing more than client states of the Soviet Union. Remember, after 1945, Eastern Europe will fall, uh, to use uh, Winston Churchill's phrase, will fall behind that iron curtain. So these client states are essentially proxies that will help uh, spread, the, uh, spread the communist faith, so to speak. Uh, the first signs of this war occurred during World War II, where you have partisan groups attacking uh, German troops that are occupying Greece. Uh, there are also, by the way, Italian group, uh, troops that are occupying Greece. Um, there is a Greek government in exile, which has escaped Nazi occupation. But really, they are unable to exert any influence in the struggle. The resistant groups, those, those that are resisting Nazi occupation are a broad spectrum of political beliefs, from the, from the far right to the far left. The, the dominant one being the National Liberation Front, controlled basically by the Congress. Starting in 1943, there is friction between these resistant groups, and uh, there are clashes. And by clashes, of course, I mean there's, there's fighting, there's shooting. Um, there is out and out civil war in 46, when guerrilla forces controlled by the KKE uh, will, uh, will, 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 it is just flat out civil war. And um, the North will be controlled and under the influence of the communists, being closer to those Soviet client states and, uh, and the opposite for the South. 1949. Greek Communist Broadcasting Station announces the end of open hostilities, however, and many of the remaining communist fighters uh, flee to neighboring Albania, again, a Soviet client state. Uh, Greece thereafter will be a uh, member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, for decades after that, Greece will be uh, vehemently anti-communist, and uh, so much so that in 1967, there will be a military junta that will last until 1974. And um, Greece will be polarized to a very real degree up until the 1980s. Uh, costs, 50,000 combatants, more than 500,000 Greeks temporarily displaced. Um, another sad chapter in this Cold War that was not so cold after all. Again, uh, I'm touching on each and, and one of these uh, and devoting uh, three, four, six minutes. Uh, each and each and each one of these could be in itself, you know, a long lecture. For example, the French in Indochina. We're going to look at the French in Indochina from 46 to 54. The French were in Indochina before that, uh, briefly. Uh, what happens is that the Japanese occupy Indochina during the war. They occupy all Southeast Asia, large portions of China, as we discussed. Uh, French troops are interned. And uh, after the war, France wants to come back in strength. And essentially, the, uh, the Vietnamese people are rather ambivalent about this idea. In the north, you'll have a guerrilla movement led by Ho Chi Minh proclaim an independent republic of Vietnam. Of course, the French are not going to be very, they're not going to warm up to this idea, shall we say. France will eventually agree to recognize Vietnam as a free state 
within a French union. Uh, but negotiations for this will drag on. Uh, what uh, Ho Chi Minh wants is total independence. And, uh, and of course, Ho Chi Minh has been a communist since the 1920s. Uh, he is one of the founding members of the Communist Party in uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party. He gets his training in France as a young student. In 1949, there is a provisional government headed by an emperor by the name of Bao Dai. And he is recognized by France in 1950 by the United States. So again, we have that division in the Cold War. Uh, the Viet Minh will reject any, uh, any kind of French authority over them, and, um, well, and, and consequently you're, you're going to have a, a, a war that will snowball and become larger and larger and larger, uh, with increasing casualties, uh, to the point where uh, France is really strained economically, and uh, there will be a point where 80% of uh, France, uh, French materials and ammunition and equipment will come from the United States, 80% or higher. By uh, 1951, the Viet Minh created a common front with communist groups in Laos and Cambodia. <clears throat> and therefore, we have a, uh, a Southeast Asian war development. Their uh, key general is Giep, and he will launch a major attack on a French garrison on March 13, 1954 and the famous or perhaps infamous battle of Dien Bien Phu, uh, which is in north, the northwestern uh, mountainous area of, um, of northern Vietnam, World Belt. Fifty-six days later, uh, the French lose in Dien Bien Phu. The United States plays around with the idea uh, that is under, uh, under uh, President Eisenhower how to help the um, the French, do we put boots on the ground? Do we send a detachment of, uh, of paratroopers? Uh, they even play around with the idea of giving uh, the Vietnamese a couple of uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, all in all, Eisenhower perhaps very wisely recognizes uh, that the age of imperialism is over and uh, the French have painted themselves in a corner. Uh, 1954, in the Geneva Conference, Basically, the French are out and they will withdraw. Vietnam is divided along the 17th parallel, non communist south, communist north. Uh, the north, which we typically just refer to in this time period as, as North Vietnam, is really the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And South Vietnam is the Republic of Vietnam. As I tell my students often, uh, during the 20th century and, and now into the 21st, every time you see Democratic Republic, watch out. That's not where we want to go. Okay, now let's talk about the Korean War, which dovetails very nicely with this uh, area uh, of Asia, especially after 1949. After 1949, of course, you have who going to power? That's right, Mao Zedong, very good. And uh, the pressure will be on after 1949, as you saw, on the French in Indochina, and now in other places besides Southeast Asia. There, there, there will be skirmishes with India, by the way. Um, but in 1950, Mao will decide to flex his military muscle and, uh, and eventually help the North Vietnamese. Um, in June 1950, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea will invade South Korea. Uh, let's do a little background of, uh, in the, into this before we look into, into the war itself. At the end of World War II, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to ship these Japanese troops home that are all throughout Asia, and Korea is no exception. The Allies agree that Soviet forces will accept the surrender of Japanese troops in North Korea, north of the 38th parallel, okay? And that we will refer to the 38th parallel again. And American troops, and, and by the way, some, some very few British forces, but mostly the American troops will accept the Japanese surrender south of the 38th parallel. Okay? Uh, so guess what happens? There will be a communist state, as so often happens in the north, there will be a communist state. Wherever the Soviet boot happens to uh, tread during the 20th century, guess what? You have a communist state. Surprise, surprise. And a, uh, a pro-Western um, 
rather authoritarian regime, but still a pro-Western regime in the South. June 25, 1950, North Korea, with the approval of Joe Stalin, invades the South. Uh, the United States will summon up allies to defend the South. And this happens very much by coincidence. How so? Uh, uh, the Soviet delegate who is protesting who is seated in the United Nations. Remember a moment ago I referred to uh, people of the world at that time, the governments of the world, either recognizing Beijing or Taipei, either recognizing you know, the mainland Chinese and Mao as the legitimate government of China, or Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan, which says that Mao is a usurper and, will, uh, and, and he will return to mainland China one day and liberate them from communists. Of course, that never happens for, for Chiang. Uh, the Soviet delegate uh, is absent, or actually he walks out in protest of this problem, uh, of the failure to admit the PRC, the People's Republic of China, as a legitimate government, and uh, because of that, the Security Council doesn't get a veto. Remember, any, any member of the Security Council can veto what's going on in the United, the United Nations, and uh, the United States is able to send, under General Douglas MacArthur, of World War II fame, uh, troops and, and allies uh, to help the South Koreans. And um, at, at this time, uh, the, the South Korean army and the American forces presently in, in, in South Korea are definitely on the ropes, to use a boxing term. Uh, they've been pushed southward. They're very much in danger of being pushed into the sea. Doug MacArthur, Ivan Hopping Doug of World War II fame and my Real historians understand what I mean by island hopping, and I don't want to cover World War II now, uh, says we're not going to do a frontal push up the, uh, the Korean Peninsula, but what we're going to do is that we're going to land uh, way behind enemy lines in Incheon, and uh, therefore cut off the enemy, cut them off at the knees, and this is exactly what happens. We throw the North Koreans uh, back, and uh, they fall back in disarray, as they are nearing the Yalu River, which is, which borders what other country? No one knows. China. It's up there on map. <laughs> which borders China? Uh, which borders China? Mao decides once again, with the approval of of um, Joe Stalin, uh, to uh, to come into the fight. The, the fight changes totally. There were expectations at that point of being home by Christmas. That is not to be. 180,000 Chinese, quote unquote, volunteers into the fray. And uh, from that point on, the Korean War will become a, a seesaw struggle as uh, they first throw the allies, that is the United States and its allies, back. And eventually the allies will make, uh, will make incursions uh, northward and forward. Uh, eventually, the whole fight will be stabilized roughly around the 30th parallel, and, and will end eventually the 30th parallel. Um, there is a fight uh, that becomes more and more public between MacArthur and, uh, and Truman. Uh, MacArthur wants, he, he is, uh, again, the, the, the consummate World War II warrior. He understands total war, he understands victory. And he disagrees publicly, increasingly publicly, uh, with the president. He wants to uh, blockade China's coast. Uh, he wants to threaten uh, China with nuclear weapons. Um, the question becomes, uh, by 1951, is this the place for World War III or not? Um, April 11, 1951, MacArthur has had enough and he relieves Truman of command. Uh, MacArthur does do something that is really a little, a little dirty, and, and uh, it is said that, that um, or rather Truman, uh, uh, and uh, he doesn't inform MacArthur directly. MacArthur <coughs> learns of his uh, being released through the newspapers, which is not, uh, shall we say, not quite kosher. Anyway, July 10, 51, uh, negotiations begin. Uh, they drag on and they drag on. Finally, uh, in 1952, under Dwight D. Eisenhower, 
uh, the, uh, the, the talks uh, become a little more positive. Uh, the master uh, geopolitician lets it be known through back channels, uh, notably uh, by way of the uh, of India, which is um, neutral. Remember, they are, they are part of the non-aligned movement, put that in your notes, uh, and uh, under Nehru, that um, we're considering using nuclear weapons to settle this. And uh, it seems that works. Uh, 1953, an armistice is concluded on July 27th. Okay. The results of the Korean War, 1,300,000 dead in North Korea, many of whom are civilians. Uh, at least a million Chinese. It is a closed society. We'll never really know. Um, the, the Chinese are uh, relatively under-equipped militarily. Uh, they wind up doing what the Japanese do during the end of World War II, a lot of frontal assaults, a lot of casualties for them from the Chinese. Uh, 50,000, sorry, 500,000 North Koreans, uh, and also British, Australian, uh, Turkish casualties. Uh, Many countries in, in the United Nations contribute uh, troops, even though they may be small, uh, even though they may be marginal, they may be, uh, for example, a medical unit, but um, uh, great participation in the Allied side. Uh, North Korea devastated, uh, and uh, further uh, devastated, uh, may I add, in the opinion of this uh, analyst, by not only the war, uh, but, but by collectivization later, uh, and, uh, which causes the, uh, the economy to go into further decline, so much so that even today, North Korea is an economic basket case, uh, continuously has to be helped by uh, the People's Republic of China and bailed out that way. Egypt, Nasser, 1956. Can't believe how full this place is considering the water. <laughs> Non-aligned Nasser uh, supports movements of national liberation, which we may be looking at next. Uh, and uh, the French are out of Indochina, but they're still in Algeria, and uh, Nasser, and the non-aligned movement will, will support these, uh, these movements for national liberation. Um, Nikita, Khrushchev, uh, Nikita Khrushchev uses this phrase, um, in, um, also in support of colonies that are that are either still they're still under colonial rule, for example Algeria, or are seeking or, or have some sort of uh, semi-independent status, but they want total independence from uh, from a former colonial power. Okay. Uh, Nasser is such a is such an individual. Uh, in uh, as a counter move. The United States will, and the United States principally and its Western allies will set up uh, what is uh, sometimes recently referred to as Pactomania. We'll set up a, a series of pacts uh, throughout the world, in Europe, notably NATO, right? Uh, the Soviets countered the Warsaw Pact, in Asia, CEDO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization. In uh, the Middle East, a, a treaty uh, or an organization that doesn't exist any longer called the Baghdad Pact or CENTO, also referred to as MITO, to a group later on. And, uh, and this is with the idea of disrupting Nasser and these people, these governments that on paper may seem to be, frankly, um, neutral, but often they are very flirty with the Soviet bloc. And of course, this worries the United States State Department. For example, Nasser will recognize the People's Republic of China, uh, will receive armaments from the, uh, from the Soviet bloc. Um, there, there are all sorts of building projects that are funded by the Soviets uh, at, at, uh, at a very uh, low interest rate when, when the Soviet Union uh, offers a loan. Uh, much lower interest rate than could be uh, that could be uh, achieved or uh, acquired from banks in the West, and this makes uh, this makes Nasser uh, highly suspect from the uh, point of view of the U.S. State Department. Uh, Nasser seizes the Suez Canal in July '56. Um, he says it belongs now to the Egyptian people, 
Uh, the counter move is that the British, French, and Israelis will organize an invasion. This happens on October 29, 56. Uh, the Israelis strike across the Sinai. Uh, paratroopers land, and uh, the canal is, uh, ships in the canal are scuttled purposefully by the Egyptians in protest of the fact that uh, these forces very quickly overtake Egyptian soldiers on, on the battlefield, and uh, they are they were very successful. Okay. And that's what, uh, that's what I have there. Uh, 50 ships are scuttled at the entrance. The Eisenhower administration is in a quandary. What do we do? And um, in, in the opinion of uh, this analyst, I think that he does the right thing. He will back the independentists, uh, or rather, the, uh, he will back the, um, the Egyptians. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult decision. It's a very difficult decision. Um, but, the, but generally, in the United Nations, Nasser is, is backed. Uh, this seems in, in the world uh, to be a, uh, a, a very imperialistic strike, a very imperialistic move by the, the French and, uh, and uh, the Israelis and the Brits. And what happened is that in, in, uh, in our relations with the French and the British, we, we get very much a black eye. Um, anyway, by December, uh, basically this, this problem is solved. Uh, the French forces and the Brits and the Israelis withdraw. The, uh, the canal is reopened on 57 April. Costs, 1650 of each ground forces are killed in the campaign. Almost 5,000 are wounded and more than 6,000 are captured or missing. Egypt is not any, does not develop closer relations to the United States. On the contrary, uh, in, spite of, in spite of Eisenhower's moves, um, the Egyptians are, are increasingly in the Soviet camp. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit. And now it is 1965. Lyndon Baines Johnson from Texas is in the driver's seat. There is trouble in the Dominican Republic. There is fear that the Dominican Republic is um, possibly tilting the way of Cuba. And you know, whenever there is a, a Texan in the White House, you know the saying. The saying is, that's right, don't mess with Texas. Rafael Trujillo, who has been the dictator of forever, uh, is assassinated in 1961. Juan Bosch of the Dominican Revolutionary Party is elected president in 62 and inaugurated in 1963. He has very leftist policies, um, land confiscation and redistribution, nationalization of foreign companies, nationalization, and, uh, you know, another term for I take it from you, and uh, more often than not, without any kind of compensation. And so what happens is very simple. Uh, you, uh, you uh, are, if you are the uh, typical American stockholder, if uh, you uh, nationalize the company or whose stocks I own, I will call my senator, which will call President Johnson, which will talk to the State Department, which will organize a coup. And uh, it does lead, uh, it does lead uh, to a military coup, uh, perhaps at this point not directly by Johnson, Okay, but certainly uh, Bush is no friend of the United States. He is critical of the United States. And General Elias Wesson and Wesson is the leader of the coup. The United States is still not involved because, um, well, a few things have got to transpire first. First and foremost, Wesson controls the Centro de Entrenamiento de las Fuerzas Armadas, or CEFA. It is a highly, uh, a highly trained military group. Uh, Wesson is an anti-communist, uh, and he says, quote, the communist doctrine, marxist leninist castro or whatever it's called, is now outlawed. So you know where he stands. Uh, power is turned over to civilian triumvirate, and the new uh, leaders uh, 
abolish and establish a, eventually will establish a new constitution, but at this point they just establish it. They, they outlaw, rather, the constitution, and uh, of course we're going to have civil strife ensue. Uh, the pro-Bosch forces versus the, known as the constitutionalists versus those people on the, on the center right and right. Uh, the constitutionalists and uh, the, the center rightists will, uh, will clash. And uh, by 1965, Rio Santo Domingo, which is under rebel control, began to call for more violent actions and for the killing of policemen. And uh, as you know what, uh, what will happen after that, there is, uh, there is, there is chaos. And LBJ says, we don't propose to sit here in a rocking chair with our hands folded and let the Communist Party set up any government in the Western Hemisphere. Um, no nonsense. No nonsense about it, as Johnson sees it. Um, Johnson will send in 20,000 troops to Santo Domingo. Uh, they will be joined by contingents of the, the Organization of American States. And in 1966, they will uh, have elections in the Dominican Republic. And Joaquin Balaguer, which you see on the bottom right, will be the president. Or as he is often known by the Dominicans, I understand, El Guerrito Balaguer. Okay. End of communism in the DR. Bolivia, 1967. is under uh, communist subversion as well. In 1963, the Bolivian officers will establish a center for instruction for special troops. These are anti-guerrilla forces. El Centro de Instrucción para Tropas Especiales, CITE in Spanish. And, uh, and uh, these are, uh, they are helped by Argentine, uh, Argentine um, officers which in, in turn are trained by the United States. Uh, 1963, by 1963, um, many of these officers are, and, and these, um, these military men are coming from uh, the United States Army Special Warfare School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And um, they are going to give um, Che Guevara and uh, guerrilla-like groups a taste of their own medicine because they will be uh, trained to operate in the jungle and, and trained in counter guerrilla operations. And they are tough cookies. 1967, Che Guevara will put together the Ejército de Liberación Nacional. Should ring a bell, Wars of National Liberation? Well, there you have it in, uh, in Spanish. The National Liberation Army. And launch a guerrilla campaign where he will try to replicate what happened in Cuba. As you will see, he will eventually not be successful. Uh, Bolivia is uh, very poor, uh, uh, and uh, there are regions in Bolivia where peasants never see a doctor. Uh, the, uh, the communists thought that Bolivia was right for revolution. Uh, in the fall of 1966, Che and uh, 15 hardcore guerrillas arrived in Bolivia, set up headquarters in a wild, uh, desolate area. Uh, country and from there they believe that their, uh, their, their campaign will snowball and grow larger and larger and eventually he will recruit the peasant population uh, which is which is basically the, uh, the guerrilla objective to um, go to the underclass, the unserved underclass and have that grow. Um, by and large the peasant population was not interested and uh, uh, they, they, were, they were disorganized, uh, food supplies run low, uh, they run into these, uh, these groups, these government troops that eventually uh, will surround them. And in July 1967, the, Boli the Bolivian Ranger Battalions and Army Units of the 8th Division close in on Che Guevara. There is a firefight. Uh, che Guevara is wounded. Many of his comrades are killed. Uh, when the Ranger Units uh, are closing in, uh, che yells, uh, 
don't shoot, don't shoot, uh, you, don't kill me, you don't know who you have as a prisoner, you don't know who I am, he pleads for his life, he is captured alive, um, he is interrogated, and um, the word comes from the high command, the Bolivian high command, that they don't want him alive, and he is killed on the morning of October 7th, and uh, there you have a chase course. The Bolivian High Command does not want to Che to become a, 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 uh, a recognizable a martyr, and uh, they're just, they're going to make him disappear. Syria, 1970 to 1986, uh, definitely a puppet state of the Soviet Union, and they will do the bidding, they will do the bidding of the Soviets. Uh, 1970s and 80s, uh, Syria has an intelligence and security network that's implicated in uh, many terrorist activities throughout the Middle East. Uh, now, understand in the 70s and 80s, uh, uh, different from the 21st century insofar that these are uh, governments that are, to a very large degree, clones of the Soviet Union. They are leftist uh, organizations. Uh, I often tell my students, um, for, for analytical semi-nerdish fun. Uh, take a look at uh, Gaddafi, for example. Take a look at Gaddafi in the 80s. Uh, in this case, he's a Libyan leader, not a Syrian leader. And if you see a photograph of Gaddafi at that time, period, he looks very much like a Soviet general. He decked in medals, a khaki uniform, and so forth. Uh, see Gaddafi at the end of his career. And the Soviet Union is no more, and he is bedecked very much like the traditional a uh, Libyan uh, peasant, a very much very Muslim, uh, when he visits America, when he goes to the United Nations, he insists on having a tent like a Bedouin because he is in touch with his Bedouin roots. At this time period, uh, these, uh, these are uh, proxies of the Soviet Union and they are trying to destabilize any pro-Western government in the Middle East and the Middle Eastern region. They are also sponsoring terrorist groups in Western Europe. Uh, there are at least 29 terrorist operations as of 1986, sponsored by the Syrians. Uh, the Syrian air, airline uh, is, is closely working uh, with the Syrian government in, in transporting uh, terrorists throughout the world. Uh, Syria has a formidable intelligence network and uh, it is funding terrorist groups. Now this is the murky, this is the murky end of politics. You know, there's, there's no smoking gun where you can absolutely prove or, or disprove anything, but you know, people people are suspect, or highly, highly suspect, and the Syrians certainly were. The Syrian intelligence uh, networks are headed by General Ali Duba. Uh, the Palestinians are funded. Uh, there, there are training camps that are uh, that are organized by the Syrians. Uh, these are radical groups, and again, at this time, they are radical leftist groups, like the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Here you go again, the Popular Front. Okay, Abu Nidal organization, Al Fatah. All of these are revolutionary leftist organizations, and uh, there you have one of their icons. Um, they have training camps. And uh, remember, this is the era of spy satellites, so we can, you know, we can, we can spy on them and, and see these training camps. Um, Lebanon, which is one of these areas that they'd like to overthrow because they have generally pro-Western government, is a target of the Syrian uh, forces. Um, there were many training bases near Damascus, uh, some 20 other training bases throughout the Middle East. In addition, the Syrians will support European leftists. Uh, for example, in, uh, in Germany, there is uh, quite a nasty organization known as the Bader Meinhof Gang, also known as the Red Army Faction. Uh, the Japanese Red Army, uh, the Kurdish Labor Party, and we can go on and on and on and on. Uh, from the Middle East to the Philippines and everywhere else in between. 
Also interesting, and this will, will affect us now into the 21st century, they also uh, support Hezbollah, the party of God. That should ring a bell for those people uh, familiar with contemporary, contemporary history. An example of Syrian activity, Paris, beautiful Paris, 1986, September, there's an explosion. And th that's linked to the Lebanese armed revolutionary faction. Uh, they uh, also assassinate a number of Americans and West Europeans and Israeli diplomats. This is open. This is open. Uh, a car or a, or a motorcycle will drive up to you, they'll open fire, and they'll disappear. Or somebody turns on the car and the car explodes. There's a magazine interview in September 86. Pierre Marion, former director of the French General Directorate of External Security, that's their security apparatus, charges that in the early 80s, Syrian intelligence agents had helped terrorist groups operate in France as part of a Syrian effort to punish France for involvement in Lebanon. Palestinian leaders have accused uh, Syria of the assassination of uh, Yasser Arafat's chief of staff in Jose Saad Yadiu. He was a moderate, can't be a moderate, have to be uh, far left. Uh, Syria in 1983 is uh, charged with encouraging radical Shia Lebanese group called Islamic Jihad. Hmm. That rings a bell. Very sure if you're, if you're familiar with, with really contemporary history. Okay. Uh, in 1983, there's a suicide bombing attack against the United States Embassy in Beirut, okay, of which you see a, a photograph there. Uh, nasty consequences, nasty outcome. And as well as attacks against the United States and French contingents of the multinational force in Beirut. That's where 557 dead occurred. So you see that the uh, communists and their, uh, and their, and their uh, proxies are very active throughout the world. I'm going to go to about a quarter after, and then we'll have a small break, and then, uh, then we'll, we'll finish up. Rhodesian Civil War, 1971 to 1979. Rhodesia, also, which you probably know as Zimbabwe, uh, is, is weak at this time. There is a white majority, or rather a white minority government in place. Uh, it, is a, um, it is a situation like, like in South Africa, uh, except that there are, there are, there is no, um, there's no cover um, on paper. At least South Africa will play this off as apartheid, as, as these uh, groups, these uh, tribes have autonomy. There's no such, there's no such facade in Rhodesia. It is a white minority government, and um, leftist uh, groups, uh, will, uh, notably the Front for the Liberation of Zimbabwe, uh, will organize a guerrilla effort to overthrow the government. Uh, these groups are often operating from bases in Zambia and from Mozambique. Mozambique, which which uh, had its independence from Portugal, had a, a similar situation. And now uh, it is a safe haven for, for these groups. Uh, uh, the people in Mozambique are known as Frelimo, Frelimo, the Front for the Liberation of Mozambique. That was born in 1962. And these, again, are proxies of the Soviet Union and China and the struggle between the superpowers continues. Will, will a, 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 a government friendly to the Soviets come to power, or will it be one friendly to the United States? The United States has, has a, a funny, funny as in strange, it's, it's, a, it's a quandary. Do we support an authoritarian government that perhaps does not embody the democratic ideals that we believe in. For example, a Rhodesian government, a South African government. Or do we let Rhodesia go from the frying pan into the fire, uh, from the point of view of the State Department at the time, anyway? And uh, 
Certainly the south end of, of Africa is also rich in natural resources. It is positioned uh, very strategically from a geopolitical point of view. Uh, we don't want that area to go communist. And uh, this next slide refers to what I was, was mentioning a moment ago, uh, with the, the collapse of the Portuguese Empire in Africa from 74 to 76, uh, Rhodesia, and also South Africa. Uh, we'll see its, its area surrounded by unfriendly nations. And, uh, and in the case of Rhodesia, Ian Smith, I am Douglas Smith will uh, declare a state of emergency to combat these uh, leftist guerrillas. Uh, the Marxist guerrillas operate from three fronts in Zambia. Uh, the violence increases, it gets quite nasty. The United States and Great Britain try to negotiate a peaceful settlement. Uh, however, the white minority government is basically unwilling to negotiate and therefore the situation snowballs and uh, the country becomes more and more polarized. Uh, as, a, as a black Rhodesian, you find yourself often in the difficult situation of do I go with the leftists, which are, are asking for, or at least on paper, you know, I'm going to get my equality, or do I go with the Rhodesian government, which doesn't seem to negotiate, or doesn't seem to negotiate in good faith. Um, in 1978, the guerrillas attacked one of Rhodesia's main cities. Um, they become quite brazen. Um, again, this thing is snowballing and uh, gets quite bloody. Well, by 1978, an agreement is reached, and uh, there is a constitutional transfer of power to, to the black majority. The country's name is changed from Zimbabwe, was changed to Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. And um, Bishop of Abdul Mosarewa is uh, the country's first black prime minister. And he gets, uh, he gets in with a um, plurality of the vote. But, uh, Joshua Nokomo and Robert Mugabe will denounce the agreement, and uh, the fighting does not end. It will continue. In the fall of 79, Britain will call for a peace conference in London. All groups are invited. Eventually, a new agreement is, is, uh, is hammered out then. Uh, during this time period, uh, the United Nations had placed economic sanctions on Rhodesia. Uh, that, that started back in 1966. They are lifted in 79. Elections occur in 1980. Mugabe is chosen as prime minister. Uh, the, uh, the country's name is then shortened to Zimbabwe, which is what you're familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, as, as often happens in the developing world, uh, Mugabe ruled as a dictator. And he uh, imported uh, North Korean uh, no, uh, troops to enforce uh, his dictatorship. And uh, as often happens in the developing world, it was not a, a happy ending necessarily. Let's talk about Lebanon. Here's some whooping, some Lebanese on them. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, Lebanon is divided into different groups. Shiite, Sunni, the Druze. And uh, they uh, had been operating under a pact called the National Pact, the 1943 National Pact, which there was a sharing of power between the Christian groups, also known as the Falangist Party. Not coincidentally, they are named Falangists like the Falangists in Spain, okay? Especially the Maronite Christians and the, and the Muslim groups. Um, Palestinians also lived in Lebanon and, and you know about the problem. And uh, many of these Palestinians belong to the PLO, or the Palestine Liberation Organization which, of course, is going to carry out attacks on Israel, uh, heightening the tensions in the area. Uh, the Lebanese Muslims tend to sympathize with the PLO. As the Muslim population, we will discover, grows and grows, uh, they are increasingly unhappy with this power-sharing 
uh, arrangement. And um, in April 13, 1975, you have four phalanges. Uh, you have gunmen kill four phalanges. And, um, and, and of course, the Christians and the Muslims are going to be divided. Uh, one group's going to retaliate against another group. It gets quite nasty. There are innocent civilians in between. And um, uh, again, you have a repetition of what often happens in the third world as the country becomes more and more uh, polarized. Uh, it is often seen by the West, it is often seen by the State Department as the, at the time, as the phalange on one side and pro-Western government. And on the other side, you have Muslims friendly towards the PLO on the other side. Uh, there is, a, so as I said, there's a, there's a policy of, of, of increasing hostility and, and, and fighting, of retaliation and, and re-retaliation. Uh, there, are, there are armed militias on either side, beside the, the, uh, beside the army, besides the Lebanese army. Uh, uh, quite a, uh, quite a uh, violent situation. The army is almost in the middle, doesn't, doesn't see which way to go. By 1975, in this civil war, there is no decisive advantage at all on either side. Uh, but this Lebanese army, as I said, which had been largely neutral, uh, begins to show signs of breaking up and threatening to bring its <clears throat> equipment and heavy weaponry into the conflict. Uh, February 17, sorry, February, February 1976, Syria, which is pro what, U.S. or, or Soviet Union, okay. Soviet Union, uh, is going to negotiate a settlement. It's a 17-point reform program known as the Constitutional Document, uh, but uh, but this is derailed. Within the um, within this within the the Lebanese army. You will have Muslim troops mutiny, and they will create the Lebanese Arab Army, and they in turn will join the Lebanese National Movement, and uh, it just uh, snowballs even further. You'll have Christian held Beirut, the capital, launching an attack on the presidential palace, forcing the president uh, to uh, to flee, uh, and as uh, as things escalate in '76. Syria will invade the country. October 16, 1976, Syria chose to participate in an Arab peace conference held in Saudi Arabia. Now, this is outside of, of uh, Lebanon. It's seen as a more neutral area. Uh, the Arab League meets there. Formally, this ends the civil war in Lebanon, but the tensions that caused the civil war are still are still there, uh, but by and large, the full you know full scale fighting has stopped at this point. Uh, bottom line: at the end of the civil war, the the Syrian brings stability to the area. But uh, the country is devastated economically. The capital, Beirut, is reduced to rubble. Uh, Lebanon is divided into, uh, into pro-Muslim and pro-Christian uh, sectors, separated by Green Line, which you don't cross unless you don't battle your life. And, uh, and, and will remain that way for, for many years to come. 1975 to 1991, Angola, and Cubans in Angola and Africa throughout, uh, and their efforts to destabilize uh, pro-Western governments and uh, install you know, pro-Soviet governments. All right, 1975 to 1991. Um, since 1960, the uh, Cuban government was uh, very, very close to the Soviet government. Uh, by 1961, 62, uh, uh, Cuba is a um, it's a, it's a little cookie cutter of the Soviet Union. Everything is collectivized. There's no private property. Um, Communist Party rules everything. It is a command economy from top to bottom. Let's examine 
Mr. Chairman, the 1975 to 1991 rule of Cuba uh, throughout the world, specifically in Angola. As I mentioned earlier, 1975, uh, Angola, it, which was a former Portuguese colony, gets its independence from Portugal. And uh, as uh, I have often said, where there is a uh, where there is a uh, political vacuum that needs to be filled with something. And uh, there are immediately, almost immediately, factions fighting uh, each other for control of Angola. And whenever there is this sort of conflict during the Cold War, we're going to have, um, on the left, those factions being supported by the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. And, uh, and if it's on the right, it will be the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and uh, our allies. The three, the three main guerrillas that will affect the lives ultimately of millions of Angola, Angolans and uh, it will turn out to be a really nasty, drawn out uh, conflict will be uh, the FNLA, Frente Nacional de Liberación de Angola. I said that in Spanish, uh, but it's, it's in Portuguese, obviously, because of former Portuguese company. And uh, that is FNLA and UNITA, Unión Nacional para la Independencia Total de Angola. Once again, I'm saying that in Spanish for those of you that know the difference, not in Portuguese. And the MPLA, Movimiento Popular de Liberación de Angola. Okay. They can't get along with each other, and each of them wants power. So it's going to be a bloody mess, and the Angolan economy and the Angolan population will pay dearly. As I said earlier, this will become a, a key uh, war in the Cold War. Uh, the United States, Portugal, and Brazil, and South Africa, remember the South African chess piece here, uh, which is being ruled by apartheid, will, will support the FNLA and UNITA. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union, Cuba, which will send troops, or put troops on the ground, uh, the Eastern European Soviet bloc proxies, the People's Republic of China and North Korea will support MPLA, Movimiento Popular de la Liberación de Angola. I'm always curious, as a small sidebar, who uh, of Cuban heritage had any family members drafted to fight in Angola. No one in this group. Okay. Anyway, Cuba's major contributor to the Soviet uh, wars in, in Africa. They will send troops. They will send uh, everything they possibly can. In addition, of course, uh, not only to, to the stick, but the carrot, as in they will send doctors and uh, people that will build uh, wells and, and so forth. Uh, there are many leftist regimes propped up by the Soviets throughout Africa. One such example in Ethiopia, um, in used to highlight Miriam, uh, and all, all throughout Africa, Cuba will support, of course, with a financial, in turn, being supported financially by the Soviet Union, will support 17 leftist governments throughout Africa. And there you see, a, uh, on the left-hand side, a very uh, young Fidel and his brother Raul uh, to the left of him. And, uh, and on the right, Fidel speaking to uh, the, uh, the Ethiopian leader. Okay. Uh, of, of course, Haile Selassie of World War II fame has been deposed since, in case you're wondering. Uh, it was not all rosy for the communists in, uh, in Africa. In Zaire, for example, they, they had uh, setbacks. Uh, major engagement took place in Algeria, Zaire, Yemen, Ethiopia, Guinea Basu, and Mozambique. All throughout Africa. The MPLA at first defended against the FNLA, and they turn against UNITA. It becomes quite a checkerboard of coalitions and counter coalitions. <laughs> they chase uh, they chase UNITA out of the capital of uh, Rwanda in '77. Okay. At that point, UNITA was militarily the weakest. But 
After a while, it will claim allegiance to about 40% of the population. MPLA will win, eventually, militarily. Uh, they will win control of the central government in 76. UNITA and FNLA will refuse to recognize the new Marxist government, which from the point of view of the State Department, is good for us. Uh, from neighboring Zaire and Uganda, refer to your, your map. UNITA will regroup, provide the guerrilla warfare, and continue their attacks against the MPLA. Again, bad for the, the uh, economy and bad for the population. Then we are in a, in a um, semi-bizarre situation. The, the uh, white South African uh, uh, government of, uh, of uh, the, the racist of the South African and Northern government uh, will, will send uh, troops, uh, their volunteers, in actuality they're mercenaries, and, uh, and former Portuguese and, and Portuguese sympathizers will aid UNITA. And you will have, as often happens throughout history, a marriage of convenience between, between uh, center-right groups fighting the mark, black center-right groups in, in uh, the area fighting against the leftist black groups temporarily allied with the, uh, the South African government or the proxies of the South Afri African government. Uh, being backed by South Africa, uh, UNITA let South African forces maintain their bases and their territories for raids into Namibia or Southwest Africa. UNITA guerrillas have extended their control throughout Central and Southeastern Angola. Things are looking well for UNITA. They win the support of Great Britain, France, the United States, Saudi Arabia, a number of African na nations, and uh, MPLA continues to be backed increasingly so by the Soviet Union and, and Cuba. Uh, as I said previously, the, uh, the economy of South of, of Angola will be uh, will be just torn apart. One sixth of its people will be displaced. They will be refugees, and they'll they'll um, they'll strain at being refugees as they they flee into Zaire and Zambia and the Congo. They will strain the economies of these countries as well. Big mess for Africa at the time. Um, the United States, and, and I should say uh, rightfully so at the time, refuses to recognize Angola's government, uh, as long as there's Cuban troops there in the country, backing up or propping up the, uh, the regime. In 18, 1988, there are uh, talks that lead to a peace accord, and South Africa removes its troops also. <coughs> However, MPLA and the rebels continue fighting. There's another truce in 89. And it's signed by Dos Santos and Jonas Savimbi. Um, um, Dos Santos on the top left hand corner and Savimbi on the right. Uh, this, these negotiations drag on for a year. And uh, under perhaps the prodding of the superpowers, they sign a peace treaty in uh, their former colony of Lisbon, Portugal, 1991. And they end a 16 year long civil war. Uh, of course, in 1991, they, they are going to get some prodding by the Soviet Union because a, um, well, let's say a reasonable communist is in the driver's seat in the Soviet Union by the name of Mikhail Gorbachev. Affectionately known by some as Gorby. Okay. The only commie that this analyst can put up with. Okay, 1983. <laughs> Joke for the day number one. 1983, Grenada or Granada, whichever you prefer. Grenada, Granada, tomato, tomato. 1979, there is a, a group called the New Jewel Movement. They, they come into power, and immediately what they do is they suspend the Grenadian Constitution. This is usually not good news. Uh, they will. Uh, they will continue uh, the, the overthrow by executing the Prime Minister, Maurice Bishop, all of his followers, including his pregnant wife. No mercy from the left. Uh, they attempt to install a Marxist government, and uh, the United States does not like this. Okay? The United States will call on the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Okay? Remember Pactomania, which I mentioned uh, an hour or more ago, Pactomania, PACs, regional PACs, 
And, and, and of course, you always think of NATO and CEDO, but here is another one, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. And uh, they, together with the United States, will intervene in this mess. Again, there is a, a struggle by ideologies, but uh, more important and perhaps used as a, as, a, as a pretext by the United Nations, by the United Nations and the United States in particular, uh, there are students, foreign students studying medicine there. In particular, there are 600 American students. Uh, you, the U.S. invasion uh, will take place uh, with the idea that we will rescue these students and conveniently we'll also uh, throw the uh, communists out of, out of power. Uh, that happens on October 83. Um, the, uh, the United States will send in about 10,000 troops. Uh, there are 300 regional troops from these small uh, Caribbean islands nearby. And uh, the government of Hudson Austin is deposed. The United States will also run into many uh, Cuban advisors and, and technicians and uh, construction workers, which, uh, to the surprise of some, are also uh, military men. And uh, also present at that time are advisors from the Soviet Union, North Korea, East Germany, Bulgaria, uh, and Libya, um, Cuban Special Forces, combat engineers. Um, it was uh, criticized by some uh, in the world, uh, in, in the United Nations, but interestingly enough, in Grenada, they saw it as truly a moment of liberation. And uh, October 25th is a national holiday, interestingly called Thanksgiving Day, and that commemorates the, the invasion by the United States and the overthrow of the leftist government. So you know where the Grenadians stand on this. Happy ending for the Grenadians, and certainly for those uh, medical students who often reported that they were being harassed and, and, uh, and wound up at the end uh, uh, confining themselves to their, uh, to their dorms. A small incident with tremendous impact. It was 1983, and um, ironically enough, there's a flight, flight 007, pure, pure coincidence. A North Korea, Korean Airlines flight is going from North Korea, sorry, from, uh, from New York City to South Korea, to Seoul, the capital of South Korea. Um, it is a normal, everyday flight, carrying uh, passengers. It is, a, it is a, uh, a passenger airliner, a commercial airliner, not military. It carries uh, 246 passengers and 23, you know, 23 uh, crew members. It refuels in Anchorage, and uh, you continue your long flight to South Korea for business or pleasure. While you are reading your book, you're, you're listening to the movie, or whatever, they, you know, or maybe getting some sleep, it's a long flight. Uh, several things are going to happen. Uh, this includes, by the way, 22 children under the age of 12. A congressman from Georgia. Um, from South Korea, others are planning to go to Hong Kong, Tokyo, Taiwan, and other places. Okay. Unfortunately for the flight, they momentarily cross Soviet airspace. Uh, Soviet jet interceptors will catch up to the flight. And on September the 1st, 1983, over the Sea of Japan, cold, dark, uh, turbulent waters often, they are shot down in cold blood. All aboard are killed. Or should uh, this lecturer say, murdered in cold blood. Uh, there is no question as to the identity of the aircraft. Uh, the Soviet Union, not surprisingly, initially uh, denies any knowledge, and denies any involvement. Uh, later on, it claims that they had the right to do so because it was a spy mission. Um, the Soviet Union is uh, severely criticized by the West in general, and the, and the United States in particular, uh, as an outrageous act. Uh, so Anti-Soviet sentiment reaches an all-time high. Um, and uh, as the uh, Soviet Union uh, comes apart in 1991, more information is found out about this horrible act, horrible and human act. Uh, Anatoly Korkunov, Soviet general and commander of the uh, so-called air base, 
Later, he will become the commander of the Russian Air Force. Uh, was adamant that there was no need to identify the aircraft one way or the other, whether it was civilian or military. It was an intruder, and it had already flown over Soviet airspace, even though very briefly, and in a very remote area. However, in 1991, uh, Major Osipovich, the, the pilot of the aircraft that intercepted uh, the airline's flight, uh, spoke about the, uh, the incident. Uh, he said that there was no mistaking it was a commercial aircraft. The aircraft lights were blinking, the fuselage markings were visible, it was not a, it was not a spy plane of any kind. He clearly saw people through the, through the windows, the passengers reading, they were relaxing or sleeping. It was a civilian airliner. But he fired and murdered them nonetheless. All lives were lost. Later, Japanese fishermen reported uh, that, he, that uh, they heard a, a loud uh, bang, a loud uh, explosion, a bright flash on the horizon. Uh, the smell of aviation fuel was, was later reported. To add insult to injury, uh, the U.S. and South Koreans, which were carrying out a joint research and, uh, and, and really salvage operations, no one felt there was going to be anyone alive. Uh, these missions by the U.S. and South Koreans and, and even the Japanese, uh, these missions were interfered by the Soviets, even though they were in international waters. Um, almost to add insult to injury. There was often no mercy during the Cold War. I guess is the, the moral story. From 1945 to 1991, there is a tremendous and intense spy war between the Soviet Union, the United States, and all of its proxies. This is a secondary but equally important war within the Cold War, the espionage war. A, a phrase often used, active measures, referred to a form of political warfare conducted by the Soviets and, uh, and, uh, and, and the uh, Soviet proxies, um, either the KGB or, as it was known under, under uh, other, other uh, Soviet leaders, the Kachekka, the NKGB, etc., etc. Uh, in addition to collecting political, uh, to, to uh, influencing elections and, and politics, uh, they uh, collected intelligence, uh, they had uh, assessments of politicians and how friendly they were to the Soviet Union or not. Of course, that, that would be including American politicians. Uh, manipulating the media. After all, our media could be manipulated. Uh, theirs being a closed society, uh, their media could not be influenced. And, uh, and special operations, including uh, all sorts of levels of violence, uh, both uh, both within uh, Europe and, and the United States. Uh, and in that, you can include uh, disinformation, propaganda, counterfeiting official documents. I can prove that Senator so-and-so was doing such a thing, and it's obviously false because they manufactured the, uh, the, uh, the documents because Senator so-and-so would be against the Soviet Union in the United States. Uh, assassinations, uh, political repression, uh, the penetration of churches, the persecution of political dissidents throughout the world. Um, the establishment and support of front organizations. They're, they're referred to as front organizations because the Soviet Union or, uh, or the East Germans or one of the proxies was behind the organization and the organization was funded by them, or largely funded by them, although they may receive uh, donations from other people that, uh, that feel similarly. Uh, for example, the uh, the World Peace Council. How can you know? How can you be against the World Peace Council? Uh, you might send uh, your donation yourself, but a large percentage of the World Peace Council was funded by the Soviet Union. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the wars of national liberation throughout the Third World, uh, insurgencies throughout the world, uh, terrorist groups, uh, and and they were held of course by the East German and other Eastern Bloc uh, com uh, communist countries uh, that provided uh, operatives uh, to carry out the intelligence or the assassinations. 
Case in point, retired KGB major Oleg Galugin described active measures as the heart and soul of Soviet intelligence. And that's what you always do, hopefully. Okay. Okay. Um, wars of national liberation, since we've been talking about wars of national liberation. I will. Slideshow. Look how tech savvy I've become. Look at this. This is incredible. I can't believe it. I have to bat myself in the back. Okay, we have been talking extensively about wars of national liberation. It is a phrase used by Nikita Khrushchev, obviously on the left, the good looking guy is JFK on the right. Uh, January 6, 1961, Moscow, Soviet Union. Uh, he predicts that the world is moving towards socialism. Indeed, he will say infamously, we will bury you. And, uh, and that wars of national liberation will be the main instrument of that movement. Uh, the Soviets will, will support uh, the indigenous rebellions, uh, whether they're in Africa or Asia or elsewhere in the Middle East, to overthrow the fascists and the capitalists. He is referring to us, we are the fascists and the capitalists. Okay? Uh, the Kennedy administration interprets the speech as the U.S. the USSR intending to use its proxies or its surrogates uh, to uh, to foster rebellion, and indeed that's what they they intend to do. Uh, not direct com confrontation, which is mostly what happens during the Cold War. Not direct confrontation, but indirect confrontation. The end results are, are the same: to, to uh, install more Soviet proxies throughout the world and more communist governments but uh, not through World War III, but through indirect confrontation. And as stated previously, uh, you have communist movements in this time period in Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia. Vietnam becomes a, uh, a, a central case, a test case. And yes, we have there visiting Moscow, we have a very young Fidel, Let's look at the, um, look at the brains behind this. We have uh, 1967, and we look into the mind of Ernesto, nicknamed El Che Guevara, where he says, these are his words, not mine, we could look into a bright future, emphasize the bright, should two, three, or many Vietnams flourish throughout the world with their share of death and their immense tragedies and the repeated blows against imperialism and the increasing hatred of all people of the world. Nice guy. But definitely his, his vision is one uh, where um, uh, Marx's vision of a, of, uh, of a communist world is achieved. Uh, this is not surprising because since 1917, after the October Revolution, the uh, objectives of communism were shared by many anti-colonialist leaders. We, we talked about Ho Chi Minh, for example, uh, thus explaining their, their alliance between the anti-colonial forces and Marxism. Often, quite frankly, often, uh, these forces were, these people were painted into a corner, whereby uh, my, my choice is if I am against France in Algeria, then I am going to join the leftist forces that are trying to overthrow the French. And sometimes, emphasis is sometimes, uh, there was no other, or, or very few other alternatives. Now, uh, the concept of imperialism had been uh, that which theorized in Lenin's famous 1916 book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Uh, Lenin uh, believing that uh, uh, imperialism was an outcome of capitalism because the capitalists needed uh, foreign countries to 
or to which sell its, its manufactured goods and from there get its raw materials. And I mentioned Ho Chi Minh, founder of the Viet Minh. Uh, he declares the independence of Vietnam in 1945. And uh, he is a founding mem a member of the French Communist Party in 1921 in Paris. These wars of national liberation will uh, almost invariably uh, end up in a guerrilla war. These guerrilla wars we looked at a moment ago, they were from mid to late 20th century. Uh, again, indigenous, as the people living there, indigenous military groups against an imperial power. They want self-determination. The, uh, the typical grunt on the ground may not understand if he is a, a Viet Cong a member. He may not understand what Marxism is or what communism is, but he certainly wants independence uh, for his country. And um, quite often, uh, a guerrilla group will come into a village and, uh, and draft him into the service. Let's look at Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh and Mao and others like him are in favor of an asymmetric warfare. Okay? Um, in other words, uh, non-conventional or asymmetric warfare are often synonyms, and, uh, and, and these are hit and run tactics where your objective is not to uh, necessarily defeat an army outright, but to, uh, to confuse the enemy, make it hurt, have some, have, uh, some losses, and then quickly uh, retreat into the jungle and, uh, and live to fight another day. This kind of warfare has existed throughout history. And I went way back and gave you an example. 66 to 70 AD, the Great Jewish Revolt, which we'll look at very, very briefly. There were three major rebellions by the Israelis, or the, the, the Hebrews back then, against uh, the Roman army. Uh, they, they began initially because of Greek and Jewish religious uh, traditions of, of clashing in the area, uh, but, uh, but grew with anti-taxation protests by Roman citizens and uh, Jews that favored uh, the Romans being there and, uh, and they were thought of as traitors. Uh, many parallels here that you can see in these wars of national liberation, whether it's uh, uh, the Middle East or Africa or uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Agrippa II, fearing overthrow, flees Jerusalem legality, or Galilee. Uh, they will, the Romans in turn will send the 12th region, Fulvinata, to strike and restore order to the area, but they get defeated. This shocks Roman leadership. Rome back then, like the United States now, has uh, something up its sleeve. You can defeat a unit in the field. You might get very lucky, as the Germans did once in, in, in another occasion, and defeat a legion. But if you defeat one legion, Rome will throw two at you. And if you're extraordinarily lucky and you defeat two legions, Rome will just eventually gather its forces and throw three or four against you. Anyway, so you have a, a series of, uh, of legions, uh, more than 60,000 soldiers, which is a huge amount for ancient times and uh, they will begin uh, subjugating the area known as Judea. Here's some of the Roman emperors. By the summer of the year 70, the Romans have uh, breached the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, they have either captured or killed or, uh, all, the, all the defenders. Um, some escape and they are crucified a, um, a, a death meant to uh, send a message to others, as you should know by now, and, and also humiliate the person being executed. Uh, by 71, they're having mopping up operations, as we'd say now. However, there is, in the Otto 72, a thorn on the side of Rome, and that's a 
big Jewish stronghold in an area known as Masada. And from Masada, they hoped to uh, have also guerrilla, what we would call guerrilla operations throughout. I think Masada will turn out to be the DNA tool of the Jews in this case. Uh, uh, Masada is in a remote area in the desert. It is a high mountainous area, uh, yet the Romans are very patient. They will surround Masada, much like the Viet Minh surround Yen Yen Phu. Uh, they will set up a base camp and uh, uh, circumwall the, uh, the entire fortress. Uh, they will eventually uh, make a ramp. They, or of course, the Romans are tremendous builders. They'll make a ramp that reaches up to the fortress. And in 73, all 967 defenders uh, rather than, uh, rather than uh, be captured and sold into slavery, uh, will commit suicide. And there is an example of Masada. The fortress is up on top of a mountain, and what you see before you is the ramp those, the Romans build to reach the fortress. Obviously something taking quite a length, uh, quite a long amount of time, and uh, uh, while they're doing this, of course, they're under fire. From, from the defenders at all. But if you have slaves, those go first as they're building things. Okay, from that sidebar, let's look at Wars of Independence, which is part of paper three, by the way, for those of you taking the IB test, and for the uh, people taking the AP test, that would be the last two chapters of your book. Okay, examples of Wars of Independence and decolonialization in the Americas, in, in this case, specifically, but throughout the world. Uh, American War of Independence from 1775 to 1783. Haitian Revolution, okay. uh, modeled uh, or, or inspired by, by the American Revolution. Uh, the wars in the Americas from, uh, of independence from Spain generally. Okay by liberators, libertadores, such as Simón Bolívar in the northern part of South America, and José de San Martín in the southern part of South America. By the 1820s, all of these countries are independent, and, uh, and they are independent from Spain. Uh, and the one area of, of Latin America which is not Spanish, which is not Hispanic in that regard, but Brazil, Portuguese, 1822 by Dom Pedro the First, and there you have Victor Simón Bolívar and José de San Martín. Okay. okay, which of these liberation movements are considered uh, backed by the Chinese, by the Communist Chinese, the PRC, or the USSR? The following independence movements: uh, the first Indochina War where the French are involved, as we discussed earlier, 1946 to 1954. Okay, it secures the independence of Vietnam from the French. And uh, next we have the Algerian War of Independence, 54 to 62. Interesting, make a, a note to yourself, even up to 1962, the French are in the Middle East as a colonial power. The African National Congress, which uh, you should remember from class, the ANC, uh, and their struggle against apartheid. There are elements within the ANC which are outright communist. But the national liberation movements in Angola and Mozambique, as uh, we've discussed just recently, supported by Castro. Portuguese colonial wars, which will drive the Portuguese out of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea Bissau, following a revolution called the Carnation Revolution where a military, a right-wing military junta in Portugal is thrown out. Uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization, the OLO, the Organization for, for African Unity, the OAU, the Polisario Front uh, in the area of Western Sahara. In the Philippines, there's a nasty little war between the Hukbalha, also known as the Hucks, um, and uh, also the New People's Army. The Philippines also has 
the Moro National Liberation Front and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. These are separatist organizations. In, in their case, it's a little different. They don't necessarily want a, uh, a Marxist regime, uh, the, uh, for the Moros in particular, they don't want a, a Marxist regime in the Philippines. Uh, what they require is separation from the Philippines <coughs> altogether. Uh, in um, the Malayan emergency, you've got the forces of the British Commonwealth versus the Malayan National Liberation Army which is a wing of the Malayan Communist Party. That took place from 48 to 1960 and, uh, and, and sparked up until 1989. Uh, the Farabundo Martini National Liberation Front, now we're talking El Salvador, Central America. In Mexico, the Zapatista Army. In Peru, Sendero Luminoso, or the Shining Path, and the Tupac Amaru Revolutionary Movement. Uh, Tupac Amaru would be a, an indigenous uh, leader uh, that fought against Spain and Spanish domination when uh, Peru was a Spanish colony. It started in 1980, and uh, by 2000, it, it's, it was over. Uh, uh, the, uh, you are probably, the Colombians are probably familiar with FARC, Fuerzas Armadas, Revolucionarias Colombianas, or the uh, Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. That has, uh, as of uh, 2014, that has kind of uh, uh, de-evolved into more, more or less a, uh, they're just a bunch of thugs. Uh, their ideology is make as much money as they possibly can, not necessarily uh, Marxist. Uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland, had problems with the IRA, Irish Republican Army. ETA in Spain, and uh, here's a few emblems of the PLO, the youth wing of the IRA, Irish Republican Army, okay. uh, Historically, guerrilla wars against European colonial powers were nearly always a political or military success. Uh, the colonial powers were uh, tired of political, uh, as, as uh, the colonial powers, uh, even in the case of France, for example, you have uh, you have a republican uh, force, uh, form of government, and uh, and you have dissension. You have dissension with the republic, and uh, people get tired of war, especially because they all take place over an extended period of time. They become wars of attrition. There is international pressure for France to get out of Syria, uh, sorry, Algeria, um, or France to get out of um, Southeast Asia as later on uh, the same pressure was, was uh, um, felt by the United States in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, other countries will aid the rebels. Uh, the rebels will find uh, uh, areas that are secure in neighboring, in neighboring countries from where they can, uh, they can attack. Uh, however, they're not invulnerable. There are counterinsurgency operations that uh, began in the 1950s and uh, grew in force in the 1960s. Notably, the Green Berets. Uh, under Kennedy, the Green Berets uh, were formed to, uh, again, as counterinsurgents. Counterinsurgents. Green Berets uh, are teachers and they're builders as well as training the local forces in counterinsurgency. Uh, many modern countries employ these so-called man-hunting uh, operations uh, using locals as, if you fast forward, as we're, we're doing, or perhaps we could already attempt to do in Afghanistan. Uh, the idea in uh, Unit 1 there is to, to, to separate the insurgents from the population uh, so that uh, they can't get recruits or food or shelter or financing. Uh, the counterinsurgents must focus on their efforts on providing fist physical and economic security for that population. So if you're not going to help the guerrillas, the guerrillas will know this, but they will turn on you, you have to protect yourself, or I have to be able to protect you. Uh, next, for this counterinsurgency, uh, uh, the efforts at counterinsurgency to be successful, there must be a clear political counter vision that will uh, appeal to the, uh, the, the, uh, the local population. 
Uh, corrupt officials need to be removed. Uh, if there's fraud, that needs to be cleaned up. Uh, infrastructure needs to be built. Uh, tax collectors, which in the third world are infamous uh, for being dishonest, uh, must be fired uh, or replaced. Um, legitimate grievances must be addressed. Uh, I don't have enough sanitation, water, medical facilities, whatever the grievance is by the local population. Okay? And more importantly, the counterinsurgency forces must not overreact to guerrilla provocations. Uh, they must not view the, all of the population as, uh, as being the enemy, uh, but just a select group, and must view the uh, population as often being a, um, being a victim of the guerrillas. If, if they don't cooperate with the guerrillas when they're gone, then they're killed or tortured. Okay. Uh, and of course, rely on modern air, artillery, and other uh, electronic assets that you have. Okay. To be successful, they must be very mobile, and, which is what the United States uh, attempted to do in Vietnam with helicopters. Um, confinement to a strategic strong point um, is what the guerrilla wants, as in the case of the French in the Indian food. Uh, they must be integrated with local security forces and civilian elements. Uh, I, I talked about this, the Green Berets, uh, the CIA in Southeast Asia uh, training uh, local primitive people called the Hmong, uh, spelled H-M-O-N-G, but pronounced Hmong. Uh, the Northern Alliance with, uh, in Afghanistan in 2001, uh, these were people that were against the Taliban, and uh, again, they were uh, indigenous forces, uh, and have cultural sensitivity, whether, again, whether they are uh, uh, Middle Eastern or African or whatever, understand their, their, uh, their background, their cultural background. There's an example of a, um, of a Finnish Green Beret and the uh, Imung in Southeast Asia. Okay. Systematic uh, collection of intelligence, forming local defense groups. In uh, Vietnam, they were called Kit Carson units. Uh, all this keeping in mind that often the guerrillas had time on their side. Democracies are vulnerable because there is dissent, and dissent is, is legal and welcomed, uh, and there are electoral cycles which don't exist in uh, totalitarian regimes, uh, such as during the Vietnam conflict, North Vietnam, or North Korea, or the Soviet Union, or the People's Republic of China. Uh, there, there is no dissent. There, there is no peace movement. Okay. Some echoes from the past concerning wars of national liberation. This is Ho Chi Minh regarding the French. You can kill 10 of my men for every one I kill of yours. But even at those odds, you will lose and I will win. Interesting thoughts. Dwight Dave Eisenhower. You have a row of dominoes set up. You knock over the first one, and what will happen to the last one is that it will go over very quickly. Obviously talking about Southeast Asia in particular, and the quote unquote domino effect. There is um, White Dave Eisenhower, or as he was uh, affectionately known in some parts of the Americas, Hiko Eisenhower. Okay. JFK, 1961. Now we have a problem in making our power credible. And Vietnam is the place. JFK taking a stand on Vietnam. That domino will not fall, according to JFK, anyway, in 61. Okay. Ron Reagan, 1964. Looking at his mind, he says, We are at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it has been said that if we lose that war, and in so doing, lose this way of freedom of ours. History will recall with the greatest astonishment that those who have had the most to lose did the least to prevent this happening. And there's one Reagan. Richard Nixon, 1969, concerning Vietnam. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, concerning Vietnam. Uh, let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. 
Only Americans can do that. Interesting beings. Henry Kissinger, special advisor to the president. We believe that peace is at hand as the negotiations are happening in 1972, October. And there's an older uh, Henry Kissinger after he had served Nixon. After the, uh, the, the uh, peace agreement between North and South Vietnam and the United States, Nixon, in a letter to President, South Vietnamese President Thieu, in January 1973, you have an assurance that we will respond with full force should the settlement be violated by North Vietnam. And at this time, South Vietnam, again, I remind you, is a, uh, a, a client state of the United States. It, the South Vietnamese Army is funded totally by the United States, independent totally on the United States, to carry on the war against the North as the North is uh, funded and, and supplied uh, and backed politically and so forth by the communists, uh, by uh, the PRC and the USSR. 1975, funding is cut off from 1.26 to 700 million. The North will intensify its military operations against the South. Uh, this is no longer a guerrilla war, but a bare knuckle North Vietnamese Army against the South Vietnamese Army. The South finds itself on the ropes, and uh, according to historian Louis Fanning, it was not the Hanoi Communists who won the war, but rather the American Congress that lost it. Uh, Thieu, of course, is not happy about this. Here you have uh, Thieu uh, looking uh, philosophically at a map of Southeast Asia. It says, if the Americans do not want to support us anymore, let them go, get out. Let them forget their humanitarian promises. This is uh, sour grapes, no doubt, on the part of you. He will attempt to carry on the war, but of course this is impossible. And um, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, Japan, uh, but of course communism continues until 
1991 with the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, it continues politically in uh, the People's Republic of China, even though economically they are quite the capitalists now. Okay. Uh, totalitarian regimes are repressive of pluralistic uh, uh, governments. Uh, uh, other other uh, other political parties are outlaws. Are outlawed. They control everything, as the term implies. Totalitarian. Uh, they control all the uh, organs of state, uh, secret police, uh, the media, etc., etc., etc. They will employ terror tactics uh, uh, freely. Uh, it is estimated today, for example, that there are at least 260,000 uh, North Koreans in, in different uh, forced labor camps uh, working for the state, and anyone even suspected of being against the uh, Kim Jong-un uh, regime is arrested, as well as their family, as well as their family, uh, because the rationale is that uh, if you were against the government, your family knew as well, and your family should be arrested. Again, that is totalitarian. Uh, internal and external threats are created uh, to foster unity. Uh, the uh, Castroite government in Cuba, whether it's Fidel or Raul or who follows, uh, will be forever yelling that uh, the Americans are coming, the Americans who are going to invade. Again, this uh, creates unity through fear. And, uh, and they and other totalitarian governments are intent on changing the structure of society. Um, in the case of the communists, a absolute restructuring of society, uh, the elimination of private, uh, private property, private capital, everything's collectivized. In the case of the, of the uh, Italian fascists and Nazi Germans, private capital is allowed as long as it serves the interests of the state. Uh, in all kinds of totalitarian governments, uh, in, the individual is uh, uh, subordinated totally to the state, including its occupation, income, religion, okay. the state, and the people. At least in the in the point of view of the government, uh, they are one; they are merged together. Okay. And uh, this is often referred to as the carceral state. Carceral, as in incarceration, a prison-like state, prison-like state. Uh, we've, we've hit on this uh, first paragraph, the second paragraph is an ideological justification. This is another key uh, component of a totalitarian regime. There is an ideological justification, a Marxism in the case of, um, of the communists, whether they're, it's the USSR or the PRC. Marxism, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dialectic of history, the inevitability of what they want to do. Uh, in the case of the Nazis, for example, it would be Aryan supremacy, in the case of the Nazis. Uh, in the case of the Italian fascists, the principles of a corporate state. And you can, you can look into those briefly. Uh, they have been covered in class. Okay, now, there are totalitarian regimes and authoritarian regimes, where in an authoritarian regime, to di uh, depending on different levels, the government controls things to a higher or a lower, uh, lesser degree, okay? Uh, for example, uh, Yin Kuan Yu in Singapore, uh, had very strict public conduct laws um, and, and uh, excessive fines and, and even imprisonment for graffiti and, and destroying property and so forth. And quote unquote, the government is saying that this is a way to force civility. Yes. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's important that. Uh, that you are quiet in the back because, as you can tell, this place has a tremendous echo. So anything that you whisper will uh, be picked up later on. So uh, in, in the case of the Singaporean government, um, he, he, will, he will enforce these rules because he wants to 
to uh, enforce civility. I, I am going to civilize my people. Okay. Uh, we talked about the we talked about the fascist regimes. Um, according to Benito Mussolini, the fascist corporation of the state is all embracing. Outside of it, no human or spiritual values can can exist. Fascism is totalitarian, he says, and the fascist state, a synthesis of a unit inclusive of all values, interprets, develops, and potentiates the whole life of a people. Everything within the state, nothing outside of the state, in other words. Okay. The words of Joseph Stalin, it is enough that the people know that there was an election. The people who cast the votes decide nothing. The people who count the votes decide everything. Interesting. No doubt he is familiar with Chicago and Florida elections. <laughs> um, as I mentioned previously, a totalitarian regime is controlled by a single political party, such as the Nazis or the Congress. Okay. Uh, a book I, I recommend, Eric Hoffer, The True Believer, argues that mass movements like communism, fascism, and Nazism have a common trait in victory in Western democracies as decadent. They are too soft, too pleasurable, and, and too selfish. They do not sacrifice for the nation enough. You are too concerned with your, um, with your television and, and your, and, uh, I don't know, whatever, your, your materialistic, your materialistic, materialistic comforts. Okay. Uh, all of these regimes offer uh, the prospect of a glorious future. Sacrifice for the party today, and we will build a better North Korea tomorrow. Now, tomorrow may be a generation from now, or three or five generations from now, but you're expected to sacrifice today for a glorious tomorrow, whether that is North Korea or Cuba or whatever. Okay. Uh, other books, uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, you know that the uh, Oracle of All Knowledge in the Universe, Wiki, has a, always a, a, a nice little synopsis at the top before they tell you, so you might just want to look at uh, Arendt's book, uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, she also coins the phrase, the banality of evil. Uh, these people, in, these leaders and, and their minions in the regime um, don't necessarily uh, have horns and, and cloven hooves. Um, often they're quite banal, quite everyday people. But well, they do terrible things, again, in the, uh, in the pursuit of this ideology, they will do terrible things. Okay. Um, Hitler's uh, Germany and uh, Stalin's Soviet Union are considered to be uh, key. They will appear in both exams. Uh, North Korea as well, Iran, Carolina. Okay. Uh, big Brother, George Orwell's uh, Famed uh, character in 1984 has often come up as an example of totalitarianism. In this case, it is uh, uh, George Orwell. Uh, it's a nondescript political party. It doesn't say what it is, but it's, it's applicable to any of the totalitarian regimes. Okay. And uh, many analysts believe that totalitarian totalitarianism was uh, came into its own in the 20th century. Uh, because of technology. Following totalitarianism is a, a personality cult uh, where the leader is, is worshipped, put on a pedestal, whether that leader is Fidel or Kim Jong-un or wherever it happens to be. I take no credit for any of that. One dream you did that. That was quite cute, though, I have to say. wonder I did. Totalitarian democracy and totalitarian republic have also been used to classify the different styles of totalitarian rule. Uh, this is not splitting hairs. This is 
possibly something that they don't, but look into a totalitarian democracy and totalitarian republic. It, uh, we're, we're talking philosophical. Okay, possibly for your tea, okay. okay. I'm going to go through a few of these. They are not uh, they are not connected to your exams, so I'm going to go through a few of these. Uh, this is totalitarian regimes are usually born as a result of revolution, 1917 in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, 1959 in Cuba. Cult of personality we've discussed. Any guesses? Hitler, Stalin. Is that Mao? No, Mao is on the on the bottom bottom lately. Well, Mao is bottom right hand side. Uh, that would be on the top, because I'm looking at the opposite of the trophy. On the top right hand side, no ideas? That's Kim Il Jung, North Korea. Okay. Bottom left hand side, Cambodia. Pol Pot, very good. Iduce, Benito Mussolini, and Austria. Okay. Uh, with Khrushchev and who follows the cult of personality diminishes, but doesn't disappear. The cult of personality will diminish, but it's still important. Okay. The governments, though, remain totalitarian. Okay. We'll look at characteristics of the Soviet Union, and then end up with that. Single party rule, combined with, on paper, democratically elected Republics, representatives for the republics. Remember, the Soviet Union is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, similar to the United States, each republic has its own characteristics and its own representatives. They send these to the Supreme Soviet, where things are discussed and things are voted upon, and in reality, uh, it is very centralized. And uh, to quote Orwell from his Animal Farm, all the animals were equal, but some were more equal than others. In this case, the Russian Republic basically uh, had the uh, had most of the votes, and, uh, and whatever the Russian Republic did, and uh, as as uh, as seen by the aged men in the body portal, that's what happened. Okay. All property is uh, is uh, nationalized. Uh, all economic organizations other than owned by the state cease to exist, everything is controlled by the state. Everything is planned by the state. It is not planned arbitrarily. It is, it is planned, hopefully, carefully. But um, in, in a market economy, this seems to be chaotic and is determined by supply and demand. And supply and demand winds up being the best way to determine what will be produced, how it will be produced, how it will be priced, how it will be distributed, as opposed to centrally planning, as opposed to centrally determining these by the state. When this happened, invariably, it resulted in shortages. Uh, uh, the legal system has to favor Marxism. The legal system depended heavily on informers. In, uh, in Cuba, for, for example, today, uh, there are block captains called the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution. They watch and report on everything that's happening within the city block. If anything functions within a totalitarian state, it is this network of informers. Um, heavy use of gulags, uh, whether it is for imprisonment or for forced work. As I mentioned earlier, uh, North Korea today is estimated there's something like 260,000 people in such gulags. And I particularly like the, uh, the one on the right. <laughs> anyway, okay. education and all political discussion is uh, bent towards the achievement of the, the ideological, the ideology, the, the ideology at hand, whether that's Marxism or, or something else, or in the case of Nazi Germany, Nazism. Okay. And uh, in the case of of both Nazism and in the case of Marxism, it is expansive in nature. After all, Marx says, workers of the world unite. 
and he intends to, or the USSR intends to unite all the workers of the world. Uh, in the case of Nazi Germany, uh, not necessarily for the benefit of others, but for the conquest of Germany. Okay. Information is tightly controlled. After all, what, what source do you go to for your information? It is the state. Uh, when you watch a movie, uh, how is that movie put together? Uh, who authorizes the movie? The state. Okay. Foreign affairs are always executed with the, uh, the understanding that it will meet its ideological objectives. And, uh, and there you have a, a cartoon uh, from the 40s. Uh, where uh, you have this, remember before they go to war with each other, Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia and Imperial Japan are you know, very buddy buddies. In other words, gentlemen, Tojo won't hit Joe, and Joe won't hit Tojo unless they take up with each other when I start talking Joe. Very, I don't know. Okay. Problems of identification and distinction, Stalinism, Nazism, and totalitarianism. Go briefly through this. In the case of Stalinism, or the, the USSR, or the PRC, as it was, by the way, the PRC up until the late 80s, where it starts to adopt market mechanisms in its economy. You have uh, total control over all aspects of production. All the factors of production are owned by the state. In the case of Nazism and fascist Italy, private property is allowed as long as it meets the objectives of whatever the state wants to do. For example, as I often point out, uh, Fiat will be told by a Luce to stop producing cars and start making half-ton trucks. And they say, see si Luce, and that's what they start to do. If Fiat doesn't do that, then it will be taken over by the government. But private property is allowed in the case of the Nazis and the, uh, and the fascists. Okay. And with that, I conclude today's lecture.